Well, good morning, everybody. And good morning to all of you joining us from Calvary, Quakertown. It's great to have you join us this morning. We're in a series from the book of Daniel that, we call, that we're calling How to Stand Out When You Don't Fit In. And this morning, we come to a passage that probably is familiar to many of you. But even if it's not, you need to understand our passage can be explained by an idiom. Not explained by an idiot, that's something else. Explained by an idiom. Now here's what an idiom is. An idiom is an expression where the words don't mean what they actually mean. The words, for example, it's raining cats and dogs. That does not mean little furry things are falling from the sky. You stabbed me in the back. That doesn't mean you're bloody headed to the hospital. You threw me under the bus. That doesn't mean you're under the bus. This job's a piece of cake. That doesn't mean you're eating cake. Lots of idioms. Words don't mean what they actually mean. But in the beginning, idioms started by the words meaning what they mean, and then they took on kind of a life of their own. So if if you're reading with me, we're going to look at a verse that will help you understand Daniel chapter 5, And see if you can see the idiom that we sometimes use from an event that happens then. Suddenly the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall near the lampstand in the royal palace. The king watched the hand as it wrote. What's the idiom? Writing on the wall. We use that expression, right? Oh, I see the writing on the wall. I see what's going to happen because of what's happening now. Well, this is the beginning of that idiom. This is where it started. And my guess is when you use the expression, there's no real writing on the wall, but here's the beginning of that strange kind of idiom. Now, I want to uh, give you a few helpful hints as we come to the passage to help you understand. First of all, the events of Daniel chapter 5 occurred and Nebuchadnezzar has been dead for like 20 years. So even though Nebuchadnezzar is the, one of the characters in Daniel 4, Daniel 5 does not occur immediately after 4. There's like two decades in between them. And if you're counting, this means that Daniel 5 occurs about 70 years after Daniel arrived in Babylon. So Daniel came as a young guy to Babylon. This is like 70 years later. That means Daniel is in his 80s. So the idea that you may have Daniel kind of a young guy walking in and seeing the writing on the wall. No, no, no. Daniel's an old guy probably bringing his walker uh, coming in to say what's going on. Daniel is really an old guy. Another thing you may uh, need to realize is that the Persian and Median army have already defeated the Babylonian army by this time. That battle happened about 50 miles away and now that army... that that defeated the Babylonian army is making its way to the city. So all that's kind of happening in the background and you need to know some of what's going on. Chapter four and chapter five of Daniel are both about pride. That's probably why the two chapters are put next to each other, even though they're a couple decades apart. Chapter four is about pride in Nebuchadnezzar. Chapter five is about pride in Belshazzar. Both of them about pride. That's why they're linked together, even though by time, they're two decades apart. All right, got the helpful hints? All right, we're going to look at chapter five under four heads. The first of those is party, party, big celebration. Uh, So if you have your Bibles, turn to Daniel chapter five. And let's uh, look at the first five verses and read about this party. And uh, as I read, think about the kind of party a king would be able to throw, right? I mean, a king could throw like the best parties. For example, resources are unlimited. The king could just order more of this or order, order more of that. If, if they're disturbing the peace, who are the neighbors going to call? I mean, the police are responsible to the king. He could do whatever he wants. After all, everybody's going to be there. If you, if you were on the list, you will be there. How do you RSVP the king? How oh, something else is more important. I'm not coming. Everybody on the guest list is there. Every, the resources are unlimited and they can do pretty much whatever they want. Listen to this party. King Belshazzar gave a great banquet for a thousand of his nobles and drank wine with them. 
While Belshazzar was drinking his wine, he gave orders to bring in the gold and silver goblets that Nebuchadnezzar, his, fa his father, had taken from the temple in Jerusalem so that the king and his nobles, his wives and his concubines might drink from them. So they brought in the gold goblets that had been taken from the temple of God in Jerusalem and the king and his nobles, his wives and his concubines drank from them. As they drank the wine, they praised the gods of gold, silver, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone. Get the picture? All right, now don't think too much about it because your mind will wander and I'll never be able to get you back. But think about it. Unlimited alcohol. Unlimited alcohol. Lots of women are at the party. The guests did not bring their wives. Belshazzar supplied the prettiest women in the empire. His wives and his concubines are there and they're all in a drunken frenzy. Don't run down that road too far, but that's the picture. I mean, this is a lavish, debauched party. This sucker is a mess, right? That's the idea. In my mind's eye, the pleasure turns to power. So here's what happens. Nebuchadnezzar uh, begins to grow, or not Nebuchadnezzar, Belshazzar begins to grow beer muscles. Well, we did not, wine muscles. We're not told beers are wines there. And all of a sudden he begins to uh, feel like he's almost invincible. And then he remembers that probably his grandfather, Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar is a distant um, ancestor, he remembers that Nebuchadnezzar, when he invaded Jerusalem, took all of the artifacts from the temple in Jerusalem and brought them to Babylon. So Belshazzar says, I got a great idea. Let's bring all of the vessels from the temple in Jerusalem to the party and we will fill them with wine and toast each other with the goblets from the temple and we'll toast our gods. So Nebuchadnezzar, excuse me, Belshazzar brings in the vessels, they pour the wine, and they're all toasting each other. And in my mind's eye, Belshazzar raises his glass, toasts the gods of Babylon with the vessels from the Jerusalem temple, thereby mocking God, claiming that he and the Babylonian gods are superior to the Jewish God. You know this story's not going to end well, right about that point. And you'll notice... The party was crashed. The party was crashed. Here are the verses that tell us what happened. Suddenly, in the midst of the party, maybe as the, gla or the, the goblet just on his lips, he's beginning to drink. Suddenly, the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall near the lampstand in the royal palace. The king watched the hand as it wrote. His face turned pale. He was so frightened that his legs became weak and his knees were knocking. Actually, the way it's written there would say, his bowels were loosed. Think about it. The pompous, proud guy celebrating with everything. Uh, yeah, he made a mess of himself right in the middle of his own party. Uh, that's what's happening. Yeah, as I said, this is not going to end well. Well, let's begin reading in uh, verse 17. And while you're finding that, let me uh, tell you what happens. He brings in the experts, you know, all the uh, wise men of Babylon. Belshazzar brings them in, all the astrologers, the magicians, and he wants them to interpret what the hand wrote on the wall. They can't interpret what's there. They have no idea what it means. Well, then the queen mother comes in and says, Belshazzar, you may have forgotten or you may not know, there's an old guy who can probably interpret this. His name's Daniel, and he was really helpful to Nebuchadnezzar. He would interpret Nebuchadnezzar's dreams, let Nebuchadnezzar know what he should do. He's still alive, go find him. So they go and find Daniel. They bring Daniel into the party, and here's what Daniel says, beginning in verse 17. Daniel answered the king. You may keep your gifts for yourself and give your rewards to someone else. Nevertheless, I will read the writing for the king and tell him what it means. Your majesty, the most high God, gave your father Nebuchadnezzar sovereignty and greatness and glory and splendor. Because of the high position he gave him, all the nations and people of every language dreaded and feared him. Those the king wanted to put to death, he put to death. Those he wanted to spare, he spared. Those he wanted to promote, he promoted. And those he wanted to humble, he humbled. 
But when his heart became arrogant and hardened with pride, he was deposed from his royal throne and stripped of his glory. He was driven away from people and given the mind of an animal. He lived with the wild donkeys and ate grass like an ox, and his body was drenched with the dew of heaven until he acknowledged that the Most High God is sovereign over all the kingdoms of on earth, and he sets over them anyone who wishes. But you, Belshazzar, his son, have not humbled yourself, through, though you knew all this. Instead, you set yourself up against the Lord of heaven. You had, the golden, you had the goblets from his temple brought to you, and you and your nobles, your wives and your con concubines, drank wine from them. You praised the gods of silver and gold, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which cannot see or hear or understand. But you did not honor the God who holds in his hand your life and all your ways. Therefore, he sent the hand that wrote the inscription. This is the inscription that was written. Mene, mene, tekel, parson. Here's the meaning of the words. Mene, God has numbered your days, the days of your reign, and he brought it to an end. Tekel, you have been weighed on the scales and found wanting. Paris, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Then at Belshazzar's command, Daniel was clothed in purple, a gold chain was placed around his neck, and he was proclaimed the third highest ruler in the kingdom. That night, Belshazzar, king of the Babylonians, was slain, and Darius the Mede took over the kingdom at the age of 62. I told you it wasn't going to end well. It didn't end well. So we have next to each other two chapters about pride. They're, they're the same substance, right? They're about pride, but the conclusions are very different. Here's what happens. In chapter four, Nebuchadnezzar comes to his senses, he repents of his pride, and he is restored to the throne. In chapter five, Belshazzar does not repent, judgment comes, and he's slain that night. Same issue, two conclusions. In case you didn't realize it, we have the problem what will the conclusion be? Well, that's what we're going to talk about. The party has crashed. But before we talk about what the message means, I want to mention to you a verse that uh, has kind of haunted me, at least a phrase from the verse this past week. Uh, and the verse is, uh, and Belshazzar, you knew all this. You knew. And then Daniel rehearses what happened in chapter 4 to Nebuchadnezzar. That was the part I read. But right after he tells him, reminds him of what happened to Nebuchadnezzar, he says, Belshazzar, you knew, you knew. He knew that Nebuchadnezzar was arrogant. He knew that Nebuchadnezzar looked around at Babylon and claimed to be the author of what was actually a gift. That's what we talked about last week. Pride ultimately is claiming to be the author of what you've been given as a gift. So Nebuchadnezzar looks around at Babylon, remember? And he says, look at all that my hand has done. Look at the great stuff that I built. Look at all this great stuff. And soon he becomes an animal. He loses his humanity because that's exactly what pride does on the inside. Nebuchadnezzar experiences it on the outside. But by the end of chapter four, he comes to his senses. He acknowledges that God is God. And because of that repentance, God restores him to his position. Well, here we have Belshazzar experiencing the same problem claiming to be the author of what's been given as a gift. And if truth be told, Belshazzar is a pretender. In the account that I just read, Nebuchadnezzar was like a real ruler, right? I mean, he was an emperor that people traveled around to hear what he had to say. He would humble people that needed to be humble and lift them up. Nebuchadnezzar had power. Belshazzar is a pretender. His dad is the real emperor, but his dad's kind of traveling around on some weird religious stuff. He's not the real emperor. That's why he says to Daniel, I'll make you the third highest person in the kingdom because he's not the highest person. He's a pretender, but he's claiming to be the author of what is a gift. And Daniel says, you knew. Volkswagen knew. The Republicans knew. The Democrats knew. Trump knew. Hillary knew. You and I know. And that's dangerous, isn't it? 
We know, but don't do a thing about it. I'll prove it to you. Have you ever been driving? I heard about this. I've never experienced it. Have you ever been driving and all of a sudden you have the blue lights pull up behind you? And so what do you do? You pull over to the shoulder because you're very obedient, obedient and compliant. And uh, the police officer comes up and you're being on your best behavior. Make sure your seatbelt's on. Make sure you're sitting and you're getting all the paperwork ready. And eventually the police officer always asks the same question. Do you know why I'm stopping you? Now, why do they ask that? Because they really don't know and they want you to kind of help them out so they know what to write on the ticket? No, no, no. They know, and if the truth be told, we know. Do we admit that we know? Heck no. Officer, I have no idea why you're stopped. I have, I can't imagine. Look, I was only doing 85, I was only doing 45. And it's, I'm way under the speed limit. It's not a school zone. I can right turn on red. I stopped at the stop sign. The, the light was yellow when I went through. I don't know. But we know, don't we? We know. He knows, she knows, and we know. But you know what's really funny? Even though we admit that we don't know, does the police officer say, oh, you didn't know? That changes everything. If you didn't know the speed limit was 55, you can't be guilty because you didn't know. You didn't know you can't turn right on red at that intersection. Oh, well, if you didn't know, you're free. No ticket for you. You didn't know. They never say that. Here's what they say. Oh, you didn't know? You should have known. And you're lying because you did know. And here's a ticket. Pay it within X period of time. We know, don't we? And so when Daniel says to Belshazzar, the really frightening thing in this incident is Belshazzar, you knew. It may have been 20 some years ago, but you knew. You heard the story of Nebuchadnezzar. You knew what happened. And rather than learn the easy way from his example, you followed in his footsteps with pride, but not in acknowledgement, not in repentance. You knew you're doubly guilty. So let me ask you, is there anything that you know, but you're pretending you don't know so you can keep doing it? Is there some area of your life where you know, maybe you're living a life of workaholism and you know you should be home more often with the family. Look, you know, right? You know. And the consequences are going to go on for years and years and years. Or maybe you're doing something at work you shouldn't do, some little shady activity, living outside the line, cutting corn. You know. You're in school, uh, not doing your homework, but cheating off of that. You know, right? You know. The story of Daniel 5 is, uh, you may be able to hide it from your teacher, your boss, your neighbor, your coworker, your spouse, there's no shot you can hide it from God. You know, and he knows. Let's figure out how to live in light of what we know rather than continue the game of knowing but pretending we don't know. That's the biggest indictment of Daniel chapter 5. But then we come to the message. You get these words written on the wall, three words written on the wall. And we're not quite sure what they mean, right? But Daniel tells them what they mean. So here, here's the verse. The inscription that's written on the wall is mene, mene, tekel, parsa. We don't even know what those syllables mean. But Daniel interprets what they mean. After the experts come in, right, all the wise men, the astrologers, all, they all come in and they don't know what it means. And Daniel says, well, I'll tell you what it means. Keep all your silly gifts for yourself and all your jewelry. You keep it. I'll tell you what it means. Mene, tekel, parson. Here's what it means. Mene, the days of your reign are numbered. Belshazzar, the days of your life are numbered. You know what's kind of fascinating to me? Before I had that first sin, right, of our first ancestors all the way back in Genesis, before that, do you ever think about our days really didn't have numbers on them? Because they wouldn't have ended, right? Just kind of go on and on and on and on. But ever since that first sin, 
them, Adam, Eve, and all of us, our days are all now numbered. And it's kind of frightening to realize that one day the last number comes up. We don't like to think about that, but our days are all numbered now. And Daniel reminds Belshazzar, in the midst of this party, Belshazzar, you may be partying here thinking life goes on forever and ever. Time out. Your days and the days of your kingdom are numbered. Secondly, Tekel, you've been weighed. Isn't it interesting? Almost from the ancient world, weights and measures have been used to speak of justice and righteousness. And so even today, outside many courtrooms, is, you know, kind of the statue or, you know, the picture of, of that woman who's blindfolded and she holds an old balance scale in her hands because justice is supposed to be blind and justice is going to be weighed. Here's the problem. Daniel says to Belshazzar, you've been weighed, you've been put on a balance, too light, too light. If your days are numbered and you're too light, you've got a problem. We've weighed you against the standard. We've weighed you, Belshazzar, against righteousness. We weighed you against justice. You come up way too short. You're too light. You don't make the cut. Parson, broken. Tonight, your kingdom will be broken and given to someone else. And not long after the party ended, Belshazzar was killed. The Medes and the Persians came into the city. And all the way back to Daniel 2, the transition from the gold head to the silver chest happened at the end of Daniel 5. Here's what I thought about. I was thinking about that many, many Tekel Parson. Um... There are a couple of illusions that Belshazzar probably lived by, that we live by, that those words, mene, tekel, parson, help us and fix. Here's the one illusion. It's my life. I'll do whatever I want. Oh, really? Really? It's true. It's your life and you can do whatever you want. But once you decide whatever you're going to do, you can't decide on the consequences that come from it. You can make certain decisions. You can live a certain way. But once you make those decisions, you don't get to determine what happens next. So you can climb up to the top of a tall building and you can choose to jump off. You can do that this afternoon if you like. But once you leave the ledge, you can no longer make decisions. Once you leave the ledge, you're going to make a puddle. What's the illusion of uh, Belshazzar? Daniel, you don't understand. I'm the king. I'll do what I want. My life's in my hand. Daniel said, ah, wrong. Your days are numbered. You can make decisions about what you'll do, but once you make decisions, you don't determine the consequences. Your days are numbered. You are accountable. Your life is ultimately in God's hands. Well, here's a, the second one, Tekel. Here's, here's the illusion that that one kind of speaks to. But wait a minute, I'm smart enough. I'll be able to figure a way out. No, you won't be able to figure a way out. You knew God knows and the consequences will come. We're accountable to God. The illusion that your life is yours and the illusion that you'll find a way to get out of it, they are illusions. They're not going to happen. And this incident in Daniel 5 reminds us of that. And how about this illusion? Do you have this one? My life will go on and on the way it is now for as long as I want it to. My life will just continue like this. Wrong. My guess is, as Belshazzar was passing the goblets from the temple around and they're all sipping the wine, toasting the Babylonian gods, he probably thought the party would end. The next morning he'd have a headache, but everything's going to go on. Yeah, he had a real headache later that night. Numbered, too light, broken. But those three words aren't only the writing on the wall at Belshazzar's party. The Bible would tell us that those three words are written on the walls of our lives. Our days are now numbered. We have all been weighed on the scale of God's justice and righteousness and every one of us too light, too light. Therefore, our little kingdoms that we're seeking to build, 
our little resume that we're acquiring, our little package for retirement that we're putting together, either it will leave you or you will leave it, but it's broken and will be taken from you. Mene tekel parsa, numbered, too light, broken, taken from. That's the writing on the wall for us too. Well, what are the takeaways from this then? Well, we could kind of just put together four and five and say, well, we need to do what Nebuchadnezzar did, not what Belshazzar did, and that's kind of right. But here are a couple takeaways that uh, I thought I'd help you with. Here's the first one. Trust God's word. You know what I find fascinating as you read through, we're only five chapters in, but here's what I find fascinating. You notice that when things get tricky, the situation is puzzling. The king, the emperor, or whatever, whoever is in charge, when they don't know what to do, they bring in the experts. They bring in the wise men, they bring in the astrologers, they bring in the magicians, they bring in the enchanters, they bring them all in, and they never know what to do. <laughs> so in chapter two, Nebuchadnezzar brings them in and turn, they don't know what the dream was. They don't know what the dream was in chapter four when Nebuchadnezzar had it, and he said, well, what does this mean? They don't know. And here in chapter five, the writing on the wall, all the wise men, all the experts, they don't know what it means either. None of them can help. You ever notice in our day, when things get puzzling, we always bring in the experts. We bring in the PhDs. We'll bring in the sociologists, we'll bring in the psychologists. And they may provide some benefit, but on the grand scale of things, they don't know. In fact, uh, I read of an incident uh, a few years ago now that kind of reminded me of that. When Becky Pippert was in school at Harvard, she was taking a, a counseling course. And in the counseling course, uh, they, were, they were doing a case study. And the professor's walking them through this case study. And here's what the case study was. Here's a husband, and he's destroying his marriage. He's destroying his family. He's a terrible husband. He's a terrible father because he's living with guilt because he hates his mother. He hates his mother, can't do anything about it. He's trashing his life, his marriage, his family. And so Becky Pipper raised her hand and said, we need to help the guy forgive his mom. In psychology class at Harvard, the psych prof said, uh, forgive. If you're talking about forgiveness, you're in the wrong department. You don't learn about forgiveness in a psychology department. Go across the street to the divinity school. Maybe they can help you. How are we going to fix the man's problem without forgiveness? Isn't that interesting? The experts don't provide real help, but God's word provides the real help. So when Daniel speaks the interpretation of the dream in chapter two, he tells them what the dream means from God's perspective. When he explains the dream in chapter four, it's from God's perspective. And when Daniel explains what the writing on the wall means, he's giving God's word on the subject. So I don't know where you are right now in your life, and I'm not sure what issue you're counting on. And so, yeah, go to the experts. They may be help, but make sure your primary trust and allegiance is in what God says and who God is. Because his word isn't just good for this week, and he won't just give you helpful hints on how to live this next season of your life. God's word will give you perspective and what you need to live forever. Trust God's word. That's one of the lessons we learned from five chapters, and even in Daniel chapter five. Here's the next one. Kind of get a grip on your pride. Come to grips with your pride. Deal with your pride. You ever notice that pride is often the sin under the other sins? So there are lots of sins in our world that we see. The sin of superiority. What's the sin of superiority? Always critiquing someone else, thinking you're better. Underneath, that's the sin of pride. What's, un what's the sin under the sin of racism and prejudice? Isn't it pride? You think you're in your little group is superior to someone else. Isn't the sin of pride underneath worry? Why are we worried and anxious? Because we know how life should go and we're afraid that God's not gonna have it go that way, but we know better than God, should, than God knows. Wait a minute, God knows what he's doing. He loves us and is all powerful, we can trust him. Pride is often the sin under the sins. Therefore, come to grips with your pride. And how did we define pride last week? It could be defined the same way in chapter five. Claiming to be the author of what is actually a gift. All those things in our lives that are most precious to us have come as gifts from God. They all come because of God's grace. You didn't earn them. They all come as God's grace to you. Treat them as gifts. Be humbled by who God is. 
all that he's given you, come to grips with your pride. But maybe the primary lesson, not just from Daniel 5, all five chapters thus far, but this chapter too. Why don't you trade up? Trade up to a new king. So what's going on at the end of Daniel 5? If you've been here for a few weeks, you remember that Nebuchadnezzar, decades before, had a dream. And in the dream, he sold his giant statue. The giant statue had a gold head and a silver chest and a bronze belly and iron legs and clay feet. Remember that? And so Daniel comes in. None of the experts could decipher it. Daniel says, oh, here's what it means. You, Nebuchadnezzar, are the bronze head. But after you will come another kingdom. And after that kingdom will come another kingdom. And after that kingdom will come another kingdom. And after that kingdom will come another kingdom. But one day, God's going to knock the whole darn statue down and establish his kingdom forever and ever. And what we see at the end of Daniel 5 is the transition from the gold head to the silver chest. Babylon is now done, and Medo-Persia becomes the ruler. But soon Medo-Persia will be taken over by another and another and another until God establishes his eternal kingdom. So I don't know about you. Don't trade up for the Medes and the Persians. Don't trade up for the Romans. Don't trade up for someone else. Don't trade up for the American rulers. Trade up for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. That's who we trade up for. Because God's kingdom never ends. It fills the universe forever and ever. Let's start living by those values, those principles and priorities now, because that kingdom never ends. Now, I don't have to tell you that the greatest competition to Jesus as king is not Belshazzar as king, and it's not Cyrus as king, And it's not Nebuchadnezzar as king, it's you as king and queen, right? God's greatest competition to ruling my life and having me live as he wants is me. I want to push him off the center and I want to call the shots. That's the greatest competition. So when I say trade up to a new king, I'm not talking about allegiances on the outside necessarily. I'm saying your primary allegiance on the inside So whatever you have at the center, whatever voice, whatever principles, whatever values, call the shot in your life. Trade up. Trade up to following Jesus and continuing what he started because that kingdom and its values never, ever end. That's kind of an IQ test, right? Let's stand and pray. Father, we give you thanks for this really weird story that takes place at a party. But the really weird story speaks to the situation that we find ourselves in today. We often uh, want to claim to be the author of what you've graciously given us as a gift. Lord, I pray that you would help us to trust your word, not our voices, not even the voices of the experts, but help us to prize and primarily lean on your word. And help us, Lord, to... Deal with the pride that is underneath many of the sins, maybe most of the sins in our lives. Thinking that we're superior, thinking that we've created, thinking that we deserve, thinking that other people are getting a better deal. Lord, help us to deal with that. Because if we could deal with that, then we would understand what it means to have you call the shots on our lives rather than we call them. In other words, help us to trade up Trade up from being our own king. Trade up from calling our own shots, determining our own priorities, living by our own values. Help us to trade up. Adopt the principles of the kingdom. The principles that Jesus came and lived and taught. Help us to follow him and continue to build that kingdom until he returns and establishes it forever. We pray in his name. Amen.